episode 11 is going to be Craig Christie. Um, Craig's a local reporter for Highland News Media. Um, he covers a lot of local football. Um, Highland League, Elgin City. He's basically got an unrivaled knowledge of local football. Um, his 1-11 will we'll kind of show you that. And he talks a little bit about his uh, life in football journalism. And um, a second... Um, episode in a row where his, his dad's been mentioned um the late great mike christie um i hope you enjoy the episode ready to go right? yeah recording mate okay um we are starting off with episode 11 today um i've actually wanted to get craig on for quite a while um i've heard a why? lot <laughs> why why <laughs> um do you know what i've heard a lot of nice things about you everyone i've asked about you um you've got a big association with local football um mm-hmm. i'm, I'm genuinely interested to pick your brain and your knowledge and things like that because um to me there's you're probably the biggest voice in media locally for sport um and any press and journal article um any northern scorting article that's something to do with elgin say something to do with the highland you click it on it's your name is there mm. um so welcome craig christie uh Thank first for us how are you today um I'm i know good. you're a busy man so i do appreciate your time um I'm going to get straight into it because we've got quite a lot to get through in the next hour or so. Um, Northern Scott reporter, um, is that your main or is it Highland News Media? What do I want me to use? It, I started with the Northern Scott, um, but Highland News and Media, so it's kind of um, spread its wings, if you like. It's a big newspaper group now, really covering the whole of the Highlands and Islands. So uh, I covered, or I work out of the Elgin office there. So I cover the, the, the three Bamshire papers, the Huntley Express, Forest Gazette, and the Northern Scot. So that's six papers that I write for. Six papers, seven days a week. And there's, <laughs> well, yeah, it can pretty much goes into that with the weekend work, but that's sport for you, isn't it? It's more, yeah. it's more happening in the weekends. Aye, exactly. Um, do you think it's, has your job become more complex in the last couple of years with the social media side aspect of it, like more and more? Because um, the Press and Journal, um, the the Northern Scot, the, the, they're big on their sport. A, a, a lot of... After an Elgin City game, you'll have a, a few reports. You maybe have a match goal that's been put up. You'll maybe have um, a report on the game itself. You'll maybe have a, an, an, an interview with the manager himself. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just one club. You cover the Highland League as well. There's, uh, is it 20 clubs, 18 clubs in the Highland 18, League? 18 at the moment, yeah. yeah. Um, how do you manage? <laughs> well, I mean, our patch covers quite a lot of those Highland League clubs now, really. So it's, but it's, it's great because I used to, when I just worked for the Northern Scot, it would just be the five or six Murray teams that I covered. But now I go further afield to Devonvale and to, to Huntley and, mm-hmm. and clubs like that. Um, so it's great. It just it, you sort of just spread your wings a little bit. You get to speak to more people, and that's that's a great part of my job. You know, you're just chatting to people. You're building up good relationships with that's it. your local sports people, and and, and, it, and it's great to you know. You, you want to see these clubs su- succeed and, and do well and it's a h- kind of hard one because they're playing each other from one week to the next so you've got like Forrest playing Lossy or something and you'd enjoy good relationships with both clubs and yep. uh, so you can sort of play them straight down the middle <laughs> Aye, you know how to sit on a fence mate <laughs> Aye, absolutely <laughs> Okay, question number one Craig, how good a, a football player were you as a kid? Uh, oh, I've never been noted for my football uh, abilities as such and I really do wish I'd stuck into my football a lot more. Mm. Um, my dad was a football coach and, and but he never ever pressed it on me really, you know, you know, you get some some dads who just kind of want to push and push with their sons but he just kind of sat back and let me enjoy yeah. you know, what I wanted to do. Uh, no, I was never I was never a naturally talented footballer. I always worked hard and I played welfare football for about a dozen seasons, something like that. Yeah. School uh, teams and things like that. School teams and um, I, yeah, I kind of t- took a couple of times out of football, you know, just took a wee step aside for a couple of years and then got an enthusiasm back and went into it. I've uh, been a regular playing five asides from when I was in my 20s till the present day. Yeah. <laughs> Still kicking about in my 50s and on occasions when my legs can handle it. But um, but no, my football ability was very, very limited and a lot of my pals, who I've seen them way surpassing me and, and going on and playing you know, playing at a decent level. I was always pleased to see that happening. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I'm, I was never the greatest of football players and I, I went to school or my pals were good football players and I'm quite happy to see the positions they've got and yeah. we just kind of spoke about some of them players there. Um, what's your earliest memory of football? It was Kenny Dalgleish. Kenny, back in the 70s, just when I was a wee kid uh, and I remember watching the 
the European Cup final 1978, I would have been six years old uh, and seen this Scottish guy scoring the winning goal with his famous grin in his face and his arms aloft. And it just, just, just for a wee boy, sort of learning about a football, you know, through, from through my dad and everything, it just, it was infectious seeing that big yeah. smile. That summer he played in the World Cup for Scotland uh, in Argentina as well. So I just saw him again scoring goals for Scotland and, and it was just a, an addiction after that. I just wanted to know who he played for and and I, and I sort of like started following his clubs and his career uh, constantly. So it was, it was uh, you know, you, sometimes you just get inspired by a, by a great player and he was a great player who, for many, many seasons. So, so uh, yeah, he, he kind of got me into the football bug, if you like. Yeah. Um, just kind of some stats on Kenny. Um, he, do you know how many caps he got for Scotland? 102, I think. 102. It's a record. Um, mm -hmm. Shares with, I can't remember, I think it's possible. Dennis Law? No. He's got the goal scoring record with Dennis Law. That's what, that's what I'm thinking. He's got 30, 30 goals for 30 Scotland. Goals. Um, yeah. But his career, 559 games, 229 goals. Now, that's, <laughs> I'm trying to think back. It's a, it's a much harder game of football mm. for somebody to score 200 goals you look at someone like Haaland these days it's, it's not hard you know it's not hard for him to go he's almost at 200 goals and the guy's about 23 24 mm. years old but Kenny Douglas was doing this on boggy pitches and um, getting kicked about the park and, and he still done it with kind of some silky grace about him he was still he probably for the best part about three or four years the best football player in the world mm. um, do you think that he kind of underachieved with Scotland considering the teams that we had back then, kind of the late 70s, early 80s. I would probably, when we went to Argentina, we were probably, if you look at the team on paper, considered one of the top three or four teams mm -hmm. there considering where the players were at the time. Do you think they massively underachieved or do you think that it's it's just, it's a Scottish thing that we go in with big expectations and we just let ourselves down because... I don't know. Something. We're Scottish. We're Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. it was a common accusation against the likes of Kenny Dalglish and, and even Alan Hansen, Graham Souness, some of the Liverpool guys that played for Scotland in those days. And they say, oh, they, they play so much better playing for Liverpool than they do for Scotland. But I think in international football, and I think Andy Robertson, to a certain extent, gets the same rap if a, a little bit these days. Uh, you're playing with different guys. It's a different yeah. style of play. Um, you can't out and Liverpool have been a club in particular that really have a brand of football that was worked on and worked on and religiously kind of set do well the players Dalglish and Souness and Hansen all sort of play to that that sort of religion if you like and um, and it just was a different way with Scotland you weren't you weren't necessarily getting the same relationships with you guys and, and it just, of course they played a lot of international football and in the home international tournament back in those days as well so you maybe had a, a wee bit more games uh, international games but yeah. uh, you were never going to enjoy the same same uh, relationships as you are at club football because it's a uh, then in the day in, day out kind of uh, relationships you got in the end. So, um, but yeah, I mean, Kenny maybe could have had more of an impact. And uh, you get some international teams who have like that one world class player that lights them up and, and can even take them to the major championship finals and everything. It didn't quite happen for Kenny. Yeah. And it was, there was that little Scottish thing as well that just held us back. It was just the finest and finest of margins that we didn't qualify to the, the later stages. Sometimes you get the last 16 and and you're on a you're on a roll from then. Scotland just have never got to that point. But obviously we're gonna change it this summer. Yep. We've always had a thing that we play well when it doesn't matter. And mm. we, when it really does matter, we're, we're shocking. We're, we play really well against the good teams mm. and the teams we should be beating. We should, we, I think it's Peru um is one of the games that we got beat or Peru Peru, we got beat by Iran, we drew with that was a, that was that Argentina campaign. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, those are probably the games where where I can add Oglish maybe should be lighting the, the match up a little bit more, but I think we underestimated those teams really badly. Yeah. And, and Peru were South American champions at the time. I know. Yeah. I know. And we knew nothing about him. It was Ali McLeod who was telling the world that we were going to win the World Cup, I think, at yeah. that time. And the song uh, and everything. That's it. Uh, that's it. Um, okay. Kind of more, my next question is kind of more related to your, your career, uh, Craig. How did, at what age did you become interested in like sports journalism? Really, I mean, I enjoyed writing. I was quite good at English at school, but I never went on to further education or anything like that. But I would say in, in, my, in my teenage years, I left school thinking should have gone to university, didn't get amazing qualifications really. Um, just 
just had a, a passion about football and I, I really wanted to turn my writing into that. So I actually left school wanting to become a sports journalist and I suppose I fulfilled that. It took a, a bit of time to get there. Yeah, uh, I had to sort of work hard and then rely on some some good opportunities coming my way, which which did come. But even even when I did start with the Northern Scott, I started as a as a circulations and distributions rep. So I was I wasn't even well. I say I wasn't writing. My paid job wasn't to to actually write about news or sport or anything. I was I was out there in the van doing the deliveries and getting the getting the Scots on the shelf, if you like. Um, but was that the goal? Yeah, well, because I actually started writing straight away. The sports editor at the time, he knew that for a couple of years before I started at the Northern Scott, I, I was doing work for some of the, the papers, like the Green Final, which was the Saturday night paper. Um, yeah. and I worked for the, for them. I worked for Sunday Post for a couple of the, the local Highland League teams as well. So I'd done a little bit of sports writing and I, I sort of felt like I had a, a flair for it anyway. I, I had the basics. And when I started at the Northern Scott... Um, I just I more or less volunteered my services as like there was anything I can help out with on the news desk. Uh, and sure enough, they, they got me covering Highland League and covering, in particular, Elgin City matches. Yeah. And um, what kind of time were we talking, Craig, with, with when this started? Um, what time would you have started covering Elgin City matches? What year? Roughly? Uh, probably about the mid 90s. It's come up to come up to 30 years ago now, which is which makes me feel really old. Um, but yeah, the, the, the green final. And the Sunday Post stuff, it was kind of passed on to maybe a combination of, in, in actual fact, the Northern Scots sports editor at the time was a guy called Harry Bremner, the late Harry Bremner. He, I think, was was close to retirement age at that time, I think, and he passed on some of the Elgin City stuff to me. And it was a, it was a great initiation for me because it was deadline stuff. You were doing live reporting, more or less. The green final consisted, you had to run and find a phone. There was no mobile phones in those days, no social media. You had to actually take some time out of the game, go through to an office, make a phone call, report, uh, phone through parts of the report, and you, you were knowing that the game was still going on and there could be a goal at any minute. You would often hear a roar and say, right, okay, I need to go back and find out what happened there. But it was it was a great initiation <laughs> for me and I really enjoyed that part of it. The Sunday Post was obviously a little bit after the game, but um, and, and another guy who was a, a big influence for me was like the late, great Willie Grant. The, um, guys of a certain age you might yep. know this, he's a Highland League legend. Yep. Goal, goal scoring legend and played for Elgin for years as well he's got I think he's the highest all time Highland League goal scorer um, from his time in the 60s he's, he scored he's, he beats Elgin City 1-0 up against Celtic on his debut in a Scottish Cup tie and Celtic scored twice in the last five minutes to steal it 2-1 at Borough Briggs you know so that was the kind of historic start that he made uh, this is before my time but I met Willie through he was a, a friend of my father's and he was he, he, after his, his football time. He he was um, he, he got into journalism. He was working at the Northern Scot at the time as an advertising rep and an advertising edit man. But he was also writing writing for the Sunday Post for the Green Final. And he passed some work on to me as well. My very first job with the Northern Scot was nineteen ninety six Scottish Cup tie Elgin against Whitehall Welfare, and he got called away in another job. The last minute just says do you fancy filling this in and it was it was it was quite a a massive job of pressure it was like you know i had to write a lot of copy for the game yeah um but i was i was buzzing for the opportunity and this i thought this is what i've been waiting for really uh got to write when this this is before i'd even joined the scott mm -hmm. it was a huge buzz and see my first byline in the northern scott it was I just bet. great you know i think i bought 10 copies of it that week you know? <laughs> have you still got a copy um I've, there's <laughs> definitely one line about you somewhere yeah. yeah yeah for sure um it, <sighs> I suppose, do you feel like, when you get started, do you feel like you've got to go and get them big stories or you just feel like you've got to go and kind of chip away at things and um, just kind of build your way up? What, what what was your strategy when you started it? You tend to be, you had a routine, so you were doing, No, I wasn't necessarily covering one team at the time, but uh, stories would just come along. Sometimes it is often the case in journalism, You just, just in any given week, something major can happen and, and, and you're on it you're, you're on it it's your job to, to go there and report on it uh, but you followed your routines and if you build up good relationships in, in, in this job you find that you can sometimes get the wee undercover stories uh, yeah. just through knowing people getting a wee bit off the record information uh, delving a little bit deeper you can get some of these some of these stories and there's not there's, it doesn't happen very often up here in, in Murray uh, that you get some real massive stories but 
even some of the little under under the cover uh, pieces that are happening there, you know, you just have to build up good relationships. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's hugely important. Even things doing, doing things like this, networking, you know, it helps. Mm. You, you speak to one person, they speak to another person. Oh, he's a good guy. And then the next thing you know, you've got a working relationship with two or three people that way. And mm. I think I it. think most of the conversations I have with football managers these days, that you know, you might speak to them for 20 minutes and maybe less than five minutes is on the record stuff and the rest of it is off the record they're telling you things that are happening you know so you know you've built up a good relationship based on that and they'll be telling you rumours from other clubs as well which is all the better yeah yeah no it's great mate it's, it's, it's a fantastic insight into it um, during your career who is the most famous person you've come across kind of reporting and through the paper and things like that I had to think about this one but I managed to blag a press pass for the Ryder Cup uh, when it was in Scotland about oh, 10 years ago was it maybe no less than that now I think at Glen Eagles, um, got two days, got to cover two days. It's, it's by far the best sporting experience that I've, I've ever had at a live event. It was yeah. an incredible atmosphere. You're in the press conferences there, and you've got guys like, like, like you know, Phil Mickelson and, and Rory McIlroy, who was still just just emerging as a as a great golfing talent at the time. Um, and Tom Watson was the American captain as well, and there was a bit of a sort of a ding dong between Mickelson and Watson because Mickelson was a player, Watson was the, the team captain and they didn't see eye to eye. So you're in the press conference and you were asking some of the questions there as well and trying to get to the bottom of it. So they, yeah. it's like just golfing mega stars that were there and there was just this guy who, I'm not, I'm not even a golfer, I love watching the golf, uh, to be involved in such a major event like that and to be you know interviewing the victorious European team at the end and Marco Roy and guys like that. It was an unbelievable experience. I'll never forget that, and I really hope it comes back to Scotland again soon. Do you ever get imposter syndrome places like that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I did. the classic story from that particular um, that weekend was that I had a really dodgy mobile phone at the time, and okay. it was the battery just kept on crashing on it. It just wasn't charging properly, so I was having to try and top it up whenever I could when I was out in the course and. I, so got back and we covered the the, the victorious uh, celebrations and the um, the trophy was was sitting there. It was one of the Sky Sports guys was actually shepherding the trophy away to another room and it was under a cover. Um, and I just tapped him on the shoulder. I, says, I don't suppose I could get a picture here with myself with Ryder Cup. And he goes, "Yeah, no problem, do that." So he took my phone and he thought he'd taken the photo, but then when I when I got the phone back off him, it was this blank screen. Uh, the battery had, the battery was gone <laughs> and and he was away I couldn't ask him to come back and do it again obviously the phone was dead so I, I missed out on my, my, my picture with the rider cap there oh, <laughs> small small things Craig it's oh, oh, gutted for you mate I know um, I, I was interested in this one um, what do you think is the biggest story you've covered in your career because I thought there was a few possible angles but you kind of I didn't think of the one you'd, you'd kind of replied to me with yeah, well, there was the ticket fiasco with Elgin City and obviously the Rangers season that they had down in the bottom league and Elgin drew them in the Scottish Cup then as well. And there was all sorts of stories going around that a lot of clubs were overselling their tickets for the matches. They could squeeze the capacity and get even more money out of it. Yeah. Uh, and Elgin followed suit and it actually broke on the Friday night. I think the game, I can't remember if it was the Saturday or the Sunday, the game, but the Friday night I did a a live a sports show for Murray Firth Radio out of the Elgin studio and it was just breaking more or less then and uh, myself and Stephen Ratley were, we were in the Elgin studio and John Rose was in Inverness studio and you know we we're just going to be talking about this game of football and, and the game of football wasn't going to be happening and um, obviously Elgin tried to chance it a, a little bit too much and it's a, a, an episode in their, yeah. their history that they're going to look back on and, and realise that they made mistakes uh, but it was it was quite sensational for something to be happening because it, you know Elgin City was suddenly thrown into the Scottish football spotlight, you know, and it and it was sort of top of all the sports stories really at the time. You know, yeah. this big match that was live on the TV was being cancelled because a wee club up north had, had tried to pull a fast one with the tickets. So. That's it. Did, did you find um, y yourself having other reporters from kind of Sun newspapers and yeah. that coming in about as well? Um, yeah, there, there was there was quite a bit of activity up there for for obvious reasons. You know, they were all, all coming up and trying to grill the club, and of course the club were were trying to keep things as low key as possible, really, and then just to realise that they'd, they'd made an almighty blunder, really. So, do you feel like in that position you've got an advantage because you are the local reporter? You've got good working relationships with these clubs that 
if there's going to be something, there's a good chance you're going to be able to get it before these other people are. It can work to your advantage that way, but in a story as, as big as that one, Elgin had to play it play it down completely, you know. So yeah. I, I didn't gain any advantage in that one at all. They weren't they weren't giving me any any more information. We knew that it happened. They had to come clean. Um, there was you know they, they'd been caught in the act really, and, and obviously they were punished for it as well, you know. So, um, but no, I didn't I didn't get an insight into that one on, on any different level anyway. But it was still a big story. Yeah. Okay. Per perfect, mate. Um, but you kind of answered this earlier on, but I, we'll kind of elaborate a little bit for it. Has it always been positive with local clubs? Have you ever had kind of any negative experiences? But you said you've you've built up good work relationships with mm -hmm. these people in these clubs. Um, is there any in particular that you've got particularly fond relationships with, um, or is it just kind of a general? Um, y y you sit on the fence, well, Craig. So you're not going to favour anyone. But um, is there anyone that particularly shot out that's been particularly nice to you over the years, or anything like that? There's been a few. I mean, there's guys that you know are always going to pick up the phone. You know, today, for instance, I spoke to Bucky Thistle manager Graham Stewart after a three 0 defeat to Nairn yesterday, a real shock result, and. You know that he's going to pick up the phone. You, you know that he's going to give you a really honest appraisal. And he was out walking his dog, and he's you know he's like, he's trying to keep control of his dog, but at the same time he's he's you know he's running over a post mortem of his his team's worst defeat, and he says yeah. they want the worst result in three seasons or something like that. I think he, guys like that, you know, you you talk to them for years and years, and and you know I think they just realise that it's it's to their best advantage, you know, to, to give you give you as much honesty as possible. There's, of course, there's some managers that are difficult customers and I'm not going to name any, any names, but some of them will keep their cards close to the chest and yeah. and rightly so. And it's, you know, there's not, there's often a mistrust of the media, if you like, and you do have to write some awkward stories about clubs when, when things aren't going well or if, if times are hard. Generally speaking though, it, you know, the, the guys, Charlie Rowley, Forest Mechanics, a long, long serving manager, you knew that you always get great comment out of him. Yeah. And you know, I've met him on occasion since he stepped down, you know, and it's 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 like a friendship thing, really. You have with these people, I absolutely, it, it, you know, it'll last forever. And, uh, and guys, I've done a great, great job in football, but are very humble about it. So it, it tends to happen in the smaller areas, the more rural kind of areas, like we are here in Murray. So that's a fortunate situation that maybe the the Glasgow press wouldn't get with the in yeah. some of the smaller clubs down there. Yeah, I suppose it helped kind of being basically the only media, and not saying there isn't other media in Murray, but. You are the main media in Murray. Yep. Ninety percent of people, in the local population, will look to these papers and things that you write for. Um, so, do do you feel almost a sense of responsibility to be writing the right thing? Um, considering, like, I'm not saying you you have influence over people, but there is so many people writing, uh, reading what you're writing. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in local local newspapers, that it, it's a different style of writing to what the tabloids would be. You know, so you you do realise you're not going to have to write the stories that that. The, the Glasgow papers, for instance, and there's there's almost like a, a desperation to to get the different angles and to a story and to to dig the dirt. Uh, there's maybe more dirt to be dug in the in the bigger clubs, you know. But up here, you, you do realise that it's the clubs on your own doorstep. You, you report when things are going bad, and I'm and I'm not shy to you know, tell a manager, you know, are you feeling the pressure? Uh, results have been really bad you know do you feel that pressure it's because I just like to ask the questions that the fans are asking really uh, yeah. that's it's the fans that read the papers and read the websites so you have to ask your questions on their behalf so that's my responsibility really to 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 ask those questions and you know I think managers on, on the whole appreciate that they don't feel that you are asking it because you're trying to get them out of a job or anything like that when it is it's a situation whereby the a manager's under pressure yeah you know when they they read social media you have to say it you know you need to turn things around they know it and uh, and they quite often do but yeah there's a responsibility there but your responsibility there yes to tell the truth but also not to try and paint a, a different picture of what's going on at a club and, and make excuses uh yeah. and, and and generally speaking i think it's that's kind of what i've done over the years yeah no i agree mate 100 percent agree with you um what would you consider uh, the best football kit ever made? I went back to my... It's almost like a Kenny Dalglish top, really, isn't yeah. it? But uh, the Liverpool kit, the classic V-neck, uh, the white V-neck, simple, simple strips. It's yeah. a different material and everything to them as well, which is something about it was a bit special. It would have been a horrible thing to wear if you were playing in a, a, 
you know, a sweaty match in Spain in the European Cup or something like that, you know, yeah. um, and it heats bearing down and you've got Did you have the kit as a, as, a, as a kid? I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, did, I had a couple of the Liverpool replica kits. I can remember the one with the Hitachi uh, sponsorship across it. It was right at the start of the 80s. Okay. Um, that was a, a Doug Leach and Sunus one and, and I've probably had a, two or three Liverpool kits over the years. It's just the classic all red. Yeah. Um, and I haven't had many bad ones over the year, but yeah, the one, the one with the V-neck, I always remember it didn't even have a sponsor on it it just had the little the little liver birds say uh, in sort of gold color uh the red with the with the the sort of white pipe into it all uh yeah classic kit that I'll very nice kit never forget yeah i've always been a fan of the candy liverpool kit i quite liked that one i've, you got, know. I've got that one as a retro uh i bought that one as a retro a few years ago it gets an, an outing in the five or size nine again yep <laughs> <laughs> love a love a retro kit mate can't beat them, pretending, can't beat I'm, them. I'm pretending i'm john barnes running down the wing right? <laughs> <laughs> was there um it's kind of speaking about that is was there a was it kenny you'd replicate as a kid because to me it was henrik larson had to be henrik mm. larson I was never a centre forward. I played as a goalkeeper, like so. It, was, it ended up being Rob Douglas for me. But uh -huh. um, was it Kenny Douglas you kind of emulated as a kid, or as you're saying there, John Barnes? You know, did that? Was there a wee bit of that in you? Yeah, I mean, uh, these guys were your heroes. But I suppose in, in terms of when I was playing, I, I had to obviously work with the tools that I had. You know, and the limited ability I had. Yeah. I was always well. I never shirked a tackle. That's one thing I can say about my football. That was, that was the, the physical side was something that I never shirked at. So. It might have been somebody more like a sort of Graham Sooners type type player that Aye. I just loved the way he got stuck in. All I say, I loved it. I mean, some of them you had to sort of shut your eyes when you <laughs> when you saw the tackles going in. Uh, but that that's really how I had to play the game. You know, mainly centre half or centre midfield. I had to battle because I didn't Aye. have the skill, the finesse, the technique. Yeah. I could win a few headers, so I I couldn't really play like Kenny or or Henrik Larsson. You know, I, I had a couple of seasons up front and. The goal return wasn't too high anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no magic, mate. Um, okay, best atmosphere you've witnessed? Again, I t I've been to some, some pretty good Hamden atmospheres and, and cup finals and things like that, but I'll never forget that Scotland-England game a few years ago uh, with the two league Griffiths free kicks because the noise was incredible. Uh, I just, you know, the first goal went in and it was, it was loud. It was an equalising goal and I thought, this is brilliant. To do it again within a few minutes, I don't think I've heard a noise like it. It was, and, and I can remember the the commentary team. It was like Gary Neville, I think, was the co commentator of the match, and he okay. and he even said it as well. He just says, "I can't believe what I'm just hearing here." You know, it was just the, the incredible racket. Uh, it was not the biggest biggest attendance I've ever been at, far from it. You know, but the noise that came out of Hamden the uh, forty eight thousand forty eight thousand in yeah. that game. Uh, it, it, it tells you what a Scotland England game is, really. You know, yeah. I, when I think of, you know back to what it must have been like in the sixties and seventies, and you were getting over a hundred thousand at these games, but madness. Uh, madness. But I don't. I mean, the noise of a goal would have been just huge then. But I suppose the football fans are a slightly different breed now. You know, and it's, it's a bit more animalistic these days. Aye, yeah, aye, aye, all over the so place. You could feel the, the feel the rivalry in that game. That's for sure. So that's your atmosphere from that game in the stadium, Ryan. Do you want to give me your atmosphere from the, that game from a pub? Oh yeah, when like tables and that went flying, yeah, that was quite a common practice in Lossie that day. I heard. But, um, <laughs> every, yeah, I mean, every I, weekend, surely. <laughs> I, well, that's the thing. Like that's what made it so gutting in the end because it, it didn't really mean anything, did it? Like no. in, in the end, because like they obviously equalised and were never qualified mm. and stuff. But that one moment felt like we'd won the World Cup. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Just because yeah. it was like it was the exact same position as well, wasn't it? From the first free kick. I mean, I think it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, like we said, Lee Griffiths went on to do great things after that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> enough said. <laughs> So I said before we came on, I've got a little quiz. So I've written down the two 11s from that game. And I'd like you and Ryan to take it in turns to see if you can name players. Um, there is 11, obviously 11 starting for both teams. There's three subs that came on for Scotland or one sub that came on for England. 10th of June 2017. I'll let you go first, Craig. Okay. Uh, I'll go for Lee Griffiths. <laughs> yep, Griffiths. Uh, Stuart Armstrong. Stuart Armstrong. Joe Hart. Joe Hart. From either side. From either side. Harry Kane. Harry Kane was captain. You will have uh, Andy Robertson. Yep. Was Christoph Berra still playing for Scotland at this time? He was. Right, okay. That's a good one. Well, I'm impressed with that one. I would never <laughs> have got that. Uh, 
Right, okay. I'm trying to think who was up top for Scotland that day. Because I think we're... Well... The, the England goal... Um, might have been Oxley chamberlain Yes, he came on as a sub. Yep, you're correct. Okay. Uh, God, I'm feeling the pressure now, man. Um, <laughs> was Colin McGregor playing? Oh no! Uh, nah, Craig's uh. a winner, I'm afraid. Craig's a winner. So we had uh, Craig Gordon, Kieran Tierney, Andy Robson, Berra, Mulgrew, James Morrison, part-time singer, um, <laughs> Stuart Armstrong, Scott Brown, Lee Griffiths. Robert Snodgrass and a catchy Anya. Oh. oh, yeah, that was around the kind of time, yeah. Hmm. Uh, MacArthur, Fraser and Chris Martin came on for Scotland. For England, you had Hart, Walker, Bertrand, Dyer, Cahill, Smallin, which is not a great England defence, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Rashford, Livermore. Oh, wow. Kane, Deli Alley, Adam Lallana and Cham Oxley Chamberlain came off the bench. So... Not actually a particularly strong England team. No, not compared to it's at a more recent times anyway. So I think they've got a bit of a golden generation going on just now, don't they? I can't believe we didn't beat them then. No. <laughs> it was literally, what was it, like five seconds left? It was literally the final whistle after that goal, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. I remember yeah. I, was, I was heading out the ground uh, and, and then I turned around and saw that was, and, and I actually left Hamden that night. Just I, I, I blanked out the England goal and I just went, I went to the pub after the game and just said, no, we won that game 2-1. I just, I managed to, Blank it out of my mind because the, the highs were such a high. Yeah, it was yeah. the same as the Euro, well, Euro 2020, as they called it, when, when we drew with them. I've never seen a, a, a celebrate a draw so much. And no, no. I was in the pub for that one, and there was guys screaming all over the place. And it's like, I've still got a game to play. We've, we're not through yet. <laughs> like, uh, Who would have been manager for that England game? Would it still have been Gordon Strachan at the time? Um, I didn't actually write that down. I would have thought it would be Strachan because Clark took over in 28. Yeah. After Kilmarnock, wasn't yeah. it? 18, 2019, right yeah, about I, then. I think I can picture the, the TV footage of Strachan dancing away in the sidelines after both the goals for Griffiths. So, yeah, it was Strachan. Underrated manager. Aye. Totally, really underrated manager. I know. Um, okay. Uh, you kind of answered it earlier on, but I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate a bit more, Craig. Uh, do you find it hard to remain unbiased when you're writing journalistic pieces? No, no. I mean, again, it, if I'm covering, for instance, say Elgin City playing against another League Two club and, and you're thinking, of course you want Elgin to win, you know, I'm an Elgin boy, but I'm watching the game and I, I can see the balance I play and I also know that in, certainly in, in most of the years that I've covered Elgin in the Scottish League, I'm going to be speaking to the opposing manager as well. Yeah. Um. So, and I, I see it from the point of view of their team. If Elgin are getting drubbed by someone, I'm not going to try to paint, paint a false picture of it all. If it's a really even game, you just say it as it is it's, it can it can hinge on little moments of the match I, I don't see any point in being overly biased and I know that some some of the Elgin fans uh, and there have been occasions when when I've I've, I've written it from a, a balanced point of view and I said oh, come on that was definitely a penalty or whatever. there was one game I remember actually at Hamden I, I travelled down to Hamden to watch Elgin play Queen's Park yep. and I'm pretty sure it was a drawn game and in the last minute Elgin had an effort which hit the underside of the bar and it was quite a good position over at the left hand side of the stand where I can't say for sure that that you know I had the the definitive sort of VR type uh, angle of it but I just remember when the ball bounced down my gut feeling was it wasn't a goal side of of the line itself you know at, at very least it bounced down on the line it wouldn't have been a goal yeah and so that's how I reported it and I think it was on my Fourth Radio at the time as well that's how I reported it I says, I says, you know, the Elgin fans and the players were shouting for it as as any club would be at the time but I said my my own viewpoint was I don't think it was a goal and I had Elgin fans that were just you know, hurling abuse at me at the time you know <laughs> say, how can you not say that it was a goal as well it's the way I saw it and that's that's the way I've always reported the way I saw it it's the only way you can yeah it is mate and you, you'll get more respect that way you know is it easier to write for Elgin when Elgin are doing well? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, there's there, there's been there's been few and far sort of seasons. The their successful seasons. They've had three times in the playoffs, but generally speaking, there's been a lot of a lot of doom and gloom around it. And you you always try to point a positive picture of mm -hmm. any time when times are quite good. And I mean, at the moment, Elgin City are oh. getting a little bit of a revival under Alan Hale. So yeah, I agree. Um, and and again, I came into criticism last season for for writing the story about what they called the. The Anis Horribilis uh, season that they had were just pretty much anything that could have went wrong last season did. Yeah. Uh, and it was. It was just a terrible year from start to finish. 
Uh, but now I'm, I've, I've written a few positive stories about the results since the turn of the year and everything, and that's the way it goes, you know. And I, I'd far rather be writing positive stories. I say that to Elgin every time I, every time I'm speaking to them, I say, look, give me more positive stories to write about, and I'll write them. Yeah, no, I, definitely, and I agree with what you're saying, Elgin. Just now, I've um, I coached down at the Gleaner, and we, we, we've actually stayed to watch some of Alan's training sessions on Tuesday night. They're fantastic. They're really well. It's, it's Stefan, I think, it runs the majority mm -hmm. of the training session. Yeah. Um, and Alan does a lot of the man management and things like that but they do seem to be on a little bit of a revival the, the signings they've brought in as well have kind of given the club a little bit of a boost I think Elgin for a little while over the past few seasons relying too much on loans and things like yeah. that whereas they've got a few of these guys under contract yeah. um, they've taken a highly rated youngster which is unheard from of from Elgin um, a guy who's been getting watched by Fulham and Southampton the last couple of seasons who's actually just joined us on loan from Bradford as well mm -hmm. Which is uh, you don't you don't hear of that like it's mm. it's, it's it's quite rare. It's it's good to see though. Um, Do you see the pessimism in the comments about that though? Like there was people going, it's not really been looked at by Southampton and Fulham. And that. Yeah, I had to reply to someone in the comments, and I says, well, I just just is it you, literally if you Google his name, it comes out Fulham and Southampton. Mm. And we're looking at him last season. It's it's two Premier League clubs last season. Southampton not now, but look like they're on their way back up anyway. He was he, he played he was. Uh, <coughs> actually going to be signed by Brentford's B team and he failed the medical. That's what Alan uh, told me on Friday. So, so you know, Brentford's B team, that's another Premier League team. That yeah. He, I don't know what the injury was, but I think he's overcome it anyway. So, um, so yeah, he's, he's definitely on the radar of these clubs and he can still continue to be on the radar, but it's, you don't want to give him competitive football at not, you know, not a bad level. You know, it's part of the initiation for a young football player. It is. Come up to Scotland and, and play in League Two football. It could be the making of him really, you know. So um, Hard league to play in. It is, and it's it's credit to Alan and Stefan's networking that they've got out there. It's, it's it's incredible contacts that they must have in the game to be to be picking up something from as far away as Bradford. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's got to be to do something to do with Stefan's Blackpool connection. There's got to be something there. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm thinking. More than likely. More than likely. Yeah. Um, possibly answered earlier on. But who's your favourite football player of all time? King Kenny, it has to be. Yeah, it's, it keeps on coming back, doesn't it? There's yeah. a common theme. I was talking about the Ryder Cup golf, actually, uh, in the tournament I was down at. I met Kenny Dalglish at the Ryder Cup that year, mm -hmm. so it was like meeting my hero. He was in a hurry to go somewhere, and, and Kenny could be a bit of a grumpy character with the media at times. And I wasn't, he wasn't known I was the media, if you like, but he... As much as he was the guy with the big smile when he scored a goal, I think he had some grumpiness and he had some short so. moments with the media when, when he was a manager as well. So... I, kind of collared him I thought I'm not letting him get past me here like I'm, I'm getting a <laughs> selfie with him absolutely certain I was I was doing that so I got him and he posed for it and again I had my dodgy phone at the time and I thought right oh, this, this phone better work this time you know for a selfie with Kenny so, and I, I was struggling to find the button and he just grabbed the phone and he just was like I'll do it sort of thing and and took the picture you know as if to say I'm in a hurry I need to get going here pal but he was nice yeah he was no. nice uh, underrated manager as well I think yeah he, um the things he done at Blackburn and even when he went on to Newcastle, the kind of football they were playing for a wee while, um, came up to Celtic, he didn't do so well at no. Celtic, but um, that Blackburn team was fantastic in the 90s. Uh, they had a, fair enough, they bought a lot of their players in mm. and that, but they had a, a core basis of, I think it was Tim Sherwood, Alan Shearer, um, it was a it was a good English core or British core of players, right. um, Colin Hendry, and Chris, Sutton. Little, Chris Sutton, Chris um, Sutton, um, really enjoyable team to, um, watch in the in the early Premier League years. Yeah, and you talk about the money as well. I mean, how many how many clubs have have thrown money in in recent times and not managed to gain the success that Blackburn did? You know, it's not yeah. just down to money; it's down to management as well and picking the right oh, players. Yeah. yeah, I agree, mate. Um, and it's weird if you ask people who's who's the captain of that uh, Blackburn team. Everyone knows how you call Hendry, but it mm. wasn't. It wasn't. It was Tim, Tim Sherwood. Sherwood. Wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a strange fact that. Um, do you want to throw in your strange fact for the for the week, Ryan? Aye, so it's a bit more of a less out there one this okay. week from the, the mother well winning Copa del Rey <laughs> moment. But uh, do you remember the number nine Bastost, the Holland player? He used to play for Wolfsburg. I've heard the name. I've heard the name. It, did he play in Portugal for a while as well? You might be onto something there. But I, I remember him mostly from the Bundesliga with Wolfsburg. He, okay. You know, he was that, that kind of whole Holland have had a few of them. He was that kind of class Jan Huntelaar type player, like number okay. nine. Um, he once went on and scored 45 one-touch finish goals in a row. 
It's quite impressive that one touch finishes. Yeah, that's quite impressive. So you're just getting on the end of yep. something. And I don't know if they're counting like stuff like penalties and that as well. I don't know if that would be it, like headers, mm -hmm. first time finishes, right? So what forty five goals? That's got to be a season and a half, that's, maybe two. That's quite impressive. That kind of reminds me a little bit of the time the journalist wrote the piece on Wayne Rooney saying he wasn't using his head enough and he went out and scored nine in a row with his head <laughs> just to prove that he could do it, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but 45 in a row. Mm -hmm. He maybe just had a really bad first touch. Well, <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't want to take that extra, extra touch and go three. He says, no, I've got to take his first yeah. time every time and it, and it worked. So, yeah. Play your strengths. Chris Boyd scored 250 goals in the league doing one touch mate so they're all tappings <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting in that guy on this podcast uh, favourite current player Craig, uh, Craig Andy Robertson yeah quality just, player just a player and again I'm going back to my Elgin City days but the first time I ever saw the guy play was for Queen's Park at Barra Briggs and, and, and he, he absolutely tore Elgin apart he was playing as more, or less, more like a left winger actually yeah. uh, just I can remember speaking to the manager at the time. I can't remember who the Queen's Park manager was. It, it may well have been Gardner Spears, if I if I think back, possibly. Um, and he just he just says this kid's something special. And and I, I sort of followed his career after that. And obviously, you know, he played Premier League. He played for Hull. And when he came to Liverpool, I was just so delighted because you know he'd, he'd broken into Scotland setup. And and I thought, I wonder if he can take it to the next level. And he just he just became this player who everyone knows right across Europe now you know he's yeah. he's uh, he's not a perfect player but his attitude his, his commitment uh, and his willingness to work hard in the game and make himself a better player you know he's, and his leadership qualities I think he's had a great influence on some of the younger players in the Scotland team as well um, it's just a joy to watch and he's another guy you know with a the massive grin in his face as yeah. well that I love to see and I watch a lot of his uh, social media videos and he's a joker like he's yeah. a proper Scotsman in that sense um, I, I think there's a quite a bit of that with Scotsmen in Premier League teams. You get a lot of that for John McGinn as well. Mm -hmm. um, he seems like that kind of character in the Aston Villa dressing room. Also, a, a fantastic player at the same yeah, time. Like ability to back it up with for sure. Yeah, you, you need to, to be these kind of players. You need the ability. You yeah. know, you, you you don't do that off of just a personality. There, there's nobody in this sport. It's Conor McGregor. You know, it's. Uh, you need you need the skills to back up the personality as well. But no, I agree with you, Robertson. And I think, do you know what? I think one of the best things, and it's just a personal opinion, being a coach and managing teams and things like that, I think if you gave the armband to someone else and took the pressure off him and just let him play football, I think he'd be, he would do even better for mm -hmm. Scotland. But I don't think we've got a better cap than none and that's the issue that's the issue but I spoke earlier on about you know the, the kind of Douglas criticisms with Scotland and, and, and again it's the same with Robertson as well he is definitely playing with better players at Liverpool than, than he is in yeah. Scotland and it's, it's, it's that integration as well the I'll, I've watched him in games and, and, and I, you know I quite often go to Scotland home games when I can and, and you watch Robertson and he'll play a pass that you know the Scotland teammates haven't been on the same wavelength He's played it into London Dykes or somebody like that, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful of London Dykes, but he's not he's not up to the caliber of you know some of the front players that play in that Liverpool side. Yeah, uh, and the fans, you know, they see the end the end pass and oh, Robertson's giving it away again, but they don't seem to have the appreciation that he's he's got the vision that maybe you know it's it's just not on the same level as as, as his teammates, and it's not a criticism of Scotland players or anybody that plays for Scotland. It's just if know, anything, it's probably a compliment to the level Liverpool play at. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than a, a criticism against Scotland, that they're actually at that higher level, and he, it's um, muscle memory. You know, mm -hmm. he's he's doing things that he does all day every day, and he's only meeting up with Scotland three or four times a year, yeah. five maybe. Um, you know, I can see exactly where you're coming from, and and it's like he's that step ahead. Um, I, I find that uh, almost with, I, I'm a big Celtic fan. And, Callum McGregor is that step ahead of everyone else in that Celtic midfield, mm. and sometimes he's making these passes, and guys are just not getting on it. But it's because he's got such a high, he's got a higher standard than everyone else, so mm -hmm. he's expecting them to make this. Um, but I also heard him say that if you don't let these guys make the mistakes, they won't know to make that pa um, run to make that pass again. So mm. it's you've got to it's it's a fine balance with them to get, to, to get them up to your level, but also to maintain your own standards at the same time. It's the, it's the credit. Of guys like McGregor and, and Andy Robertson as well, that when you see them playing these passes in a match and it doesn't come off, uh, if maybe somebody hasn't made the run that they expected, there's no frustration on their behalf, they're not getting on to the, the cases. You get Obviously you get some of these guys and you watch them in the English Premier League and they're, 
they're too big for their boots and so when they play a pass and it, and it, and it doesn't happen and the move breaks doing there's the, the throwing about the arms and the, and yeah. the gesticulating and, and everything you never ever see that from, from Robertson and McGregor no. and he knows and Robertson knows that he, sometimes he will get the flak from the from the Tartan army in, the, in these games and, and he knows that's the case that you know, he's a captain he's got to take that responsibility in his shoulders and you know he'll he'll take that and he'll he'll turn right to the guys and, and the team and say right next time it's going to work you know and it's it, I think he's just a leader by example as well you know and and, and the, the players tend to learn a lot off of guys like Robertson because he's 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 just that higher caliber player that um and and they know that he's you know he's, he's a Champions League winner as well and he's a fantastic player so. Yeah, and it's as you say, you you you've seen it from the start. You can tell from the start these players are different, aren't they? They're just built yeah. to be very different. Well, you see, you see guys, you know, a lot of talented eighteen-year-olds playing in matches at Borough Briggs. You don't know they're going to go into captain a country one day. You you just want to say, say right, I'd, I'd love to see you kind of keep keep your progression going. Yeah, but you know that well, it's not even one percent of the time that that's going to happen. You know, it's you know, Robertson was a you know a rare breed indeed. He just kept on working really, really hard, the right attitude, a good listener. Hmm. Scottish Jamie Vardy. <laughs> Scottish. <laughs> I've never heard that comparison made before, but yeah. You think of it non league football to uh, I think Vardy was let go at an early age by a big mm. club mm. and had to work his way through non league. That's right, yeah. That's essentially what Robertson's done. And it's a, it's a strange comparison to make. Yeah, totally different players. Uh, I totally look forward to his court case with Wayne Rooney's misses then. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I was just going to say, is there ever like, have either of you ever seen a player that you expected to hit that levels for Scotland that never did? Because for me, the, the instant one that comes to my mind when I think of that is Ryan Gold. If you remember him from remember. 10 years yeah. ago. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. Because um, we probably have it with like... Billy Gilmore is probably the most recent one that had a really good kind of game against England and we've mm -hmm. not really heard about anything. Obviously, that's to do with his club situation. Yeah. There was a very talented younger, youngster at Rangers a few years ago called John Fleck. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was meant to be one of the next be best things. And when he was playing at Rangers youth level, he was outstanding. Um, I can't remember. I think he went down to Sheffield United and never kind of hit the heights he was meant to. That was probably the one for me. Any kind of particular one you can think yeah, of? Yeah, I mean, the, the, like Flex performances, I think, were always being highly, ra ra highly rated, but in the lower leagues uh, yeah. down there. So he didn't quite fulfil it. Um, Gold has a good example. You kind of put me in the spot a wee bit there. For, <laughs> uh, and, and and Gilmore could still, you know, he's still young enough that he could, he could yet. Yeah. He, he may be a late developer as well in terms of like developing his own club career. To, I think um, these guys as well are better benefited if they're in Scotland for the first few years of career and yeah. they're actually getting regular mm -hmm. 20, 30 games a season for a Dundee United. It doesn't have to be a set of Rangers. A Dundee United and Aberdeen, that's what happened to Gold, that's what happened to Robertson. Even but, some English players like James Madison came up and played for Aberdeen. And then yeah, we were, I was yeah. actually speaking about him at my training session today and I says it was probably the move to Scotland that kick-started his career. Yeah. You know, um, I think it was Norwich he went to after that, mm -hmm. played a decent season. Aye, was it Coventry or something, wasn't he? And then he started kind of kicking on and he's probably one of the top three attacking midfielders in the Premier League just now um, based on form alone. But with Gilmore, it's like Chelsea, you've got no chance really, have you? Especially mm -hmm. the amount of players that they've just been signing left, but, right and centre. Yeah. Then he had the loan to Norwich, Dean Smith barely utilised him and then he's got the permanent move to Brighton now, which again is, you know, there's a good, good collection of players there to try and like force your way in again, isn't there? But... There's, he's still a bit part player at Brighton as well, mm. isn't he? There's a, there's a real talent in there, but again, it's got to work in the right system. He's got to be given the right platform to shine, and he's just not found that with his club so far. Um, who knows? It's, it's not too late for him anyway. I prefer the midfield three of McGinn, McTominay, and McGregor anyway myself. Like I think that three in the middle is just is that, it's just lethal. weird. Like we talk about Scott McTominay a lot, and we joke about him being like the best player in the world not just because he's like so clutch but I've never like all due respect to him I just don't think he's that great but like in big moments he's always there right even at club level you see him score like goals for like a really poor United side at the mm. moment yeah. and but like at the same time he's played centre back for Scotland he's played in the middle could probably do his like a number nine if we really needed to I think he started out as a striker in his youth career but yeah, it's wild. He's, like, one, he's one of those talismanic kind of Scotland players now, really. And, and James McFadden was another one. Yeah, really, really, yeah. You know, his club career, club career didn't quite you know reach the massive heights that he would have liked. But for us, for Scotland, you know, he, he came up with those magic moments so often. Yeah, uh, it's great to have players that that really do shine on the international stage. And McTominay is the latest one for sure. 
magic, mate, magic. Um, who would you consider the greatest footballer of all time? I had to say Messi. Yeah. I had to, uh, I mean... Was I, there anyone else that came close in your yeah, opinion? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I watched Maradona when, you know, when I was a kid as well and, and just, you know, for, for a guy to virtually win a World Cup on his own, you know, and, and, and incredible performances. He just, he was the most talented player, I think, of that era and, and I thought that would never be surpassed. But I've watched Messi for, for years and years and I just get joy out of watching, watching his games. You know, he kind of got the, the perfect World Cup moment there as well, yeah. which, which might never have happened for him. Uh, he was another that was accused of not producing it with the international team you know, with the club career that he mm -hmm. had. But but on a Saturday night, it just used to be, oh, what's, who's on the telly tonight? Oh, Barcelona's on it. I'm watching that because Messi's yeah. playing. And, but not just because he was this in, incredible ball player, but also, uh, I'm still talking him in the past tense here. I'm, you know, it's like <laughs> as if he's still not playing. <laughs> no. But he... Uh, his attitude, he, he he wasn't a diver. He didn't throw himself around like likes of Ronaldo, as he was another amazing player. Obviously, I just I liked his attitude. He just got up and, and got on with it. It was almost like slightly the the Jimmy Johnston sort of ethos. You know, yep. Johnston used to get lumps. I've only ever seen the video footage. He used to get lumps kicked out of him, and he just got up and says, "Right, gives that ball. I'm going to run at the same guys again. And if they kick me again, I'll go and beat them again." And 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 I think Messi had the same attitude as well. An amazing talent to, to back up and. And yeah, his goal scoring record is as well as the assists. It's it's just unbelievable. And it, I just get joy every time I watch them play. I never, I've never seen him play in the flesh, which is my one biggest regret, you know. But yeah. yeah, I've not seen him play in the flesh either. And still producing to this very day as well. Yeah. Still, um, I think it was a debut for Miami. He's put a 93rd minute free kick in for a winner. And mm -hmm. this guy's 37, 38 years old. And I. I I honestly think he's got another World Cup in him. Yeah, I, I, I really do. I think he's got another World Is Cup. Is there any point though? You can't top what he's already done. You know what I mean? Like, I just look at the the kind of crop that Argentina have got coming through though, and it's 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 quite promising for them. But look uh, how hard it is to retain an international trophy. Like France have probably had the best chance of doing it because they've had literally like three players in every position, and they came mm -hmm. close, obviously. But mm -hmm. and they've also got Mbappe, who's just it seems to light up at the World Cup, and that's that's his yeah. stage. He's a man that's going to break the records in, in terms of like the goals, the World Cup goals record. Is he's going he's gonna to take that for he's sure? Only like three off it already. I he's know. like twenty four. It's mad. Yeah, he's mm. still got another two, possibly three World Cups. Easily. In him. And mm. yeah, it's crazy. Okay, um, you any got any goals still achieving your kind of sports journalism career? Well, again, I think I mentioned sort of you know going to a major international event uh, and covering that but as a local reporter sometimes that's a wee bit of a pipe dream really but you know who knows if you get some kind of local football player who want to play for Scotland and, and play at a major championships to be able to go and cover that Olympic Games I mean these things are these things are achievable you know we've, we've had sort of local athletes you know Mark Dry competed at Olympic Games as a, as a hammer thrower yep. he's He's a, he's a barkhead boy, you know, and he, and he got to achieve his dream, you know. So if something like that happens in the future and I can do the same as I did with the Ryder Cup and blag a press pass, and, uh, <laughs> then, yeah, something like that would be great just to, just to be part of a huge, huge international event and be able to sort of report on it. You know, even just recently covering the Celtic Bucky game was, was something special because it's bet, the first yeah. time I've worked at a Celtic match and, and worked at a major major ground to see how their media system rolls really mm -hmm. uh, and they'd be able to be up there and, and, and asking questions to guys like Brendan Rogers and, and Paolo Bernardo and just firing a few questions to them uh, soaking up the atmosphere just walking about the place but no you're actually there in a working capacity and lucky enough to be in a working capacity in, yeah. a, in an arena like that that was great so that probably was a little goal there that was ticked off there just Absolutely. just very recently yeah no that, that that's that's um it's is it surreal for you being a, a kind of um, a little kind of Celtic supporter yourself getting to cover a, a Celtic game? Would that be because um, I know we've had someone recently? Uh, was it Kieran Carty who's just mm -hmm. moved from Elgin and yeah. he's now working for Celtic? And there was a lady who used to work for Elgin who covered media who now does Rangers TV. I'm pretty sure Louise Shaw worked with her very yeah. closely at, at Northern Scott and and uh, I used to kind of Louise used to shadow me and at the Elgin games when she was she was studying 
uh, basically studying journalism. Yeah. She sort of stepped onto the platform, did really well as Elgin's media person. and was a really good journalist of the Northern Scot, and then she got the opportunity the club she supports, Rangers. It was just fantastic, and I think she's sort of one of the main main media people at Rangers now. So uh, brilliant, brilliant story for him and really uh, for for Louise and really well deserved. You know, what I was saying. yeah. Absolutely. Is is it always going to be local stuff for you, Craig, or is there anything if, if, if there's an opportunity like that ever came up, would it interest you? I think I'm probably too late in my life now to be kind of changing my, my working base. I think I'm always yeah. going to be working in this area. Uh, I did have an opportunity to go and work in Aberdeen uh, in, in reporting a few years back and at the time, and, and we're talking quite some time ago actually, I think it was just personal circumstances in my life, I decided to turn it down and, mm -hmm. and carry on doing what I was doing. I've got no regrets about that whatsoever but I do think to myself if I'd taken that job who knows I might have been covering a lot of Scottish Cup finals Scotland internationals but I've got no regrets whatsoever. Do you have anyone like apprentices or that just knew any kind of young and up and coming reporters or just, just kind of I know it's majority as I say before I came on is your name I see everywhere I don't really see anyone else's name is there is there anyone else that's kind of coming along well that, I mean we've got a, we've got a great team in the Elgin office for the Highland News and Media team we won two awards there and it was two of our, our, our young um, reporters and photographers who won Beth Taylor photographer of the year in only our second year working full time in photography she's wow. only 23 I think uh, and and we've got you and Malcolm who won the business reporter of the year. He's in his twenties as well. So that we've got a real good young crop of guys coming through. Yeah. Uh, I'm not seeing they're learning anything <laughs> off of me. John, Johnny <laughs> Johnny Clark's kind of the guy who helps me in the in the Highland News and Media office. There, he's my sort of backup. Although he's the the chief reporter, uh, news reporter for the paper. When I'm on holiday, he backs me up with sport, and he's always kind of covering Highland League games and, and Elgin games as well. So you know, he does a great job with that too. So we're lucky we've got young people. To, to help old foggies like myself and, and <laughs> the more sort of technological side sometimes we we need the guidance in the in the, the digital sort of era uh we're, yeah. we're the dinosaurs or i'm the dinosaur i should i should say <laughs> no cracking mate um what time we're we talking ryan it must be uh 57 minutes mate that's all right we're, we're doing we're doing better today than we were a couple of weeks ago <laughs> oh, Stuart Black, when it was like four Stuart, and a half hours in i was like <laughs> what time what time we're on uh, an hour and 48 and i'm like whoa <laughs> um, uh, Black, he can talk yeah he can yeah lovely <laughs> guy really nice guy um proudest moment of your career well, we're just I'm just talking about the awards because I just I just attended the the Highlands and Islands Press Awards there on Friday. I was I was shortlisted, but I didn't win on this occasion. But I did win it on, on on one occasion before a few years back. I won the the, the Highlands and Islands Sports Report of the Year. Yeah. Uh, I've been shortlisted five times now, so that in itself is is a great honour to be chosen. You know, I was one of the mm -hmm. final three. Uh, to get it in five occasions, I'm very proud of that. But the one year I did win it, I think it was 2017, uh, and got the award. It was. That was special because you know you're 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 working in this environment here in the north. You know that there's a you know there's a, a real sort of it's a hotbed of talent in, in in local journalism up here, and there's a lot of good sports reporters when you when you consider the sort of the, the Highlands and Islands spectrum, if you like. Yeah, there's a lot of the, the really great newspapers on the on the islands and um, going right across the Aberdeen area. You're going out to BBC as well, so it's it's it's, it's stretching way way beyond even this Aberdeen area as well. Uh, to be honoured in that kind of company was, you know, it was it was special. So that that meant a lot to me anyway to get to get an award. You're not in it for the awards, but yeah, but to get that yeah. little bit of it's recognition nice, so. is it, yeah. it is nice. Yeah, fantastic, mate. So that's kind of the end of our questions, Craig. Um, before we get into your one eleven, because you gave me your one eleven, it's a fucking fantastic one eleven. I've got to say, <laughs> um, I would like to speak to you about. Boys League and your dad's association with Boys League mm -hmm. because um, it's not actually out yet. Um, it's actually I can't say when we're recording, but it's 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 out tomorrow. My next podcast. Um, if you're listening to this, completely ignore that. I'm just speaking to Craig, quite literally here. Um, and we had Jamie Acast on, and Jamie had a nice little. We had a nice little couple of minutes, kind of reminiscing about your dad mm -hmm. and speaking about him. So. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about who your dad was, what his association was with the Elgin Boys Club and kind of what he done down about the place? Because you probably saw that better than us. Yeah, well, I mean, virtually their entire history, this is their 60th year, I think, isn't it? It they're, is. They're celebrating and, and he started just two years after the club was formed. He was a coach, he was a manager, he he just sort of you know, helped out in every every possible role, but he just had a passion for 
for for just coaching kids and and, and seeing young people enjoying their football. It wasn't just about the ones we went on to, you know, play for Elgin City or play for bigger clubs and there were a few who went on to, you know, international honours out the Elgin Boys Club. Yeah. But if he saw you know, even like one young kid who maybe just started the season and was struggling and struggling to get a game and not really enjoying their football and by the end of that season they had a big smile on their face and, and he was just delighted with that. He, he uh, yeah, I mean, it was virtually an unbroken 56 years, I think it was, with Elgin Boys Club. There's not many people that, that have that kind of long associations with local groups. Mm -hmm. uh, he also served Elgin City as a trainer during those days because I was dragged down to Borough Briggs quite often when I was a wee <laughs> boy and had to had to sort of watch him shouting away and, and sort of really driving, driving him hard on the training ground. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine him shouting. Uh, <laughs> no, he could, he could definitely shout. Uh, and his other association, not just the Elgin Boys Club, but Burkhead Thistle, uh, he managed them, he played for them as a goalkeeper, and he managed them uh, in particular in the 1970s, where there was a season that he ended up sort of writing a wee sort of, not a, a kind of book, well it was a published book actually, but he kind of kept, kept a record of some of the 70s teams that came through, but they, won, they did a clean sweep of the, the North Junior Honours that season, a, Pretty sure they did win every trophy it was available to them. And they were beating the top Aberdeen teams at the, the team at the time as well. Yeah, and got to the last sixteen of the Scottish Junior Cup. This this was under my dad's management, but he obviously says that was nothing to do with him. And it was just the, the talent of the guys that were there. Yeah, uh, but the boys club was the number one passion for him, and he just kept on serving them even in his older his, his older age. He was there doing the, the press reports. He was the groundsman up until probably about a year before he passed away. He was mm -hmm. still cutting the grass, uh, <laughs> and he just loved being involved he hated missing missing a day and, and even the covid time as well and that was so frustrating for him because he just felt no we shouldn't be lying down to this virus sort of thing even though he might have been one of the most vulnerable people yeah um but he just says no we need to we need to get boys playing football sort of thing you know we need mm -hmm. to, to get out there so he, he loved he loved every minute of it loved his life to the full really uh and and football was was a common thread really right through his life you know, yeah trials for west brom when he was a, a youngster as well, well so uh, so Magic. yeah, he was he wasn't too bad at it either, you know. He certainly reached a level far far higher than than either of his sons did. My brother Ryan played played for a bit as well in the welfare football, but no, he he was a good goal in his time. And people to talk about you know how how fearless he was diving at strikers' feet <laughs> at a time when you goalkeepers got absolutely no protection, uh, kicks in the head and everything, bundled in the yeah. back of the net with the ball sometimes, you know. Um, I kind of we kind of spoke about it last last episode. Um, or me, me and Jamie's memory. Well, my mine especially was because um, I I knew I, I knew your dad when I was younger. I played boys league and things like that, mm. and he was always remembering coming over and getting people to man the matches and things mm. like that. But most couple of, recent couple of years is I turn around and I see the scooter there, mm. but he he wouldn't be there. He'd be a while doing something in the container, or he'd be a while watching a game or something. So he knew it was a boot. You you would see the scooter, but you wouldn't see him. He'd be a while chatting at somebody or and. I remember him saying to me, uh, I says, How, how's it going? Oh, I'm, I am fine. He says, it takes me about an hour and a half to get doing from one end of the field to the other because Ardy just keeps speaking. That's it. <laughs> Elgin High Street was the same. Well, my mum used to be totally frustrated with the fact that he would start shopping at one end of the high street and and she would just turn around and try to find him. He was just blathering at another different corner. Every, <laughs> virtually every shop he walked past and knew somebody else. So he was, he was really well kent face <coughs> and, and well respected, I think, because he just had a... Absolutely. Yeah, he was a big smile on his face. So, yeah. <laughs> and he's got a bench now as well. He has, has yeah. had a really nice gesture the club. Everything the club did actually last year, you know, with the, the, the minutes applause for all the opening week and and yeah. um, and then the, the Goalkeeper of the Year awards, which I presented at the end of the season as well. Yeah. It's 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 really, really kind of fitting tributes to, to my dad and, and the club. The club have really kind of honoured him really well there. Um, mm -hmm. Very proud of that. Yeah, no, oh, fantastic, mate. 1-11. Um, Okay, I'm going to read through it and then we're going to pick it apart. It's harder for me without going to Elgin Library or, I don't know, have you got archives and like things like that, uh, Craig, at the, the offices? Well, I've got an old microfiche machine that's got papers going back beyond a century. It's, it's a really antiquated old machine that, that sort of... It's still on reels. Wow! You reel out the newspapers, and it takes you forever to go through all the obviously all the, the copies for one particular year. But uh, it's ah, it's it's fascinating to be able to look back on some of these things. Yeah. yeah so you'll be able to give me more information. I, I suppose uh, is a lot of your um, job involved getting um, speaking to like club historians and things like that to get facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can happen. Yeah. 
Absolutely, yeah. There's, um, a, there's, a, there's they're a dying breed, I think, really. Sort of people are. that want to collect that that information, you know. But we've we've got some characters, Robert Weir at Elgin City and Easton Thane at Bucky Thistle, who helped me out a lot with their the facts uh, looking into the Celtic match uh, very recently. You know, it's 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 great to be able to pick the brains of some of these these guys that have a fountain of knowledge out there. Yeah, die hard fans as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, it's, it, I feel they're the most die hard of fans because they'll. You tell them, give them a game, and they'll tell you if I scored in the game, and if I was playing in the game, and what the attendance with the game was, yep. and ah, it's just unbelievable. Okay, you want eleven? Um, you've got Billy Gordon, Ian McArthur, uh, Neil McLennan, Dave Morland, Graham Mason, Russell Mackay, Martin Lyle, Hamish French, Cammy Keith, Martin Stewart, and Wilson Robertson. Indeed. So. Um, I've got what little snippets of information about them. Um, Billy Gordon, seven hundred twenty-one games for Fraserburgh. That was that was one of the main reasons why I picked Billy because there was a few goalkeepers there. But I, generally speaking, the team I've, I've sort of selected there, it's it might not have been the best eleven that ever played, you know, and that might not even be the, the perfect sort of Highland League select. But I picked guys that either were really sort of long-standing guys at the club itself, the club with great honour. Yeah. or guys that I can remember watching even in my younger days who just made me go wow when I saw them play in particular games and they stood out as a, as a real talent in a Highland League pitch and, and, and one or two of the guys obviously did go on to sort of play at better levels but Billy Gordon was just a guy who again he just had that bravery of a, a goalkeeper he was agile he he you know, he, I can remember I actually knew his father as well uh, his father had an association with, with the Murray area I think uh, and Billy had a, had a great attitude. He was so well liked, um, but his performances in the game, as I can remember seeing, I just think, how did he save that one? How did he save that one? And the fans at Fraserburgh absolutely idolised him, um, and they'll, they'll talk about him for for many many years to come. Yeah, no, um, it, it's we spoke to Blackie about it, a hard job, you know, a Highland League goal, and you're getting battered, and especially in the time that you're talking about, the eighties and nineties and seventies different league to what it is now you're a lot more protected these days back then you are getting kicks in the head and not just because guys are trying to aim for the ball it's because they're wanting to kick your head off its shoulders mm-hmm. um ian MacArthur. so ian MacArthur, i'm actually going to try and get on my podcast um yeah. because he's um i, I don't know my, my, my partner knows his children um jack and taylor i think it is um jack obviously plays local football mm-hmm. um highland league and that but I'm interested in Ian's story because obviously a long association with Elgin and Cali. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of player was Ian? Tenacious, uh, just also fearless. But he, he was he was a quick. He was he was actually one of the first attacking fullbacks I can ever ever remember seeing play. You know, he's just a local guy who broke into the Elgin team at a very young age, and just loved charging up the park. And it's probably an era when when a right back in, in the team was somebody you know to stick to your defensive duties. And, and maybe don't cross the cross the halfway line, but Ian would be belting up there because he had the stamina to get back every time. Yeah, uh, modern and, day fullback, I would say so very much. Uh, with the difference being that you do, you probably don't see modern day fullbacks, you know, going up and down the line, but also being such a tenacious tackler as well. I mean, some some of Ian's tackles were were, were very very strong tackles. Uh, yeah. He was never a dirty player. He, he was, he, but he 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 you would not. Um, would not fear any sort of. I think he actually preferred playing against the really sort of good reputation wingers, and there was a lot of talented wingers in the Highland League at the time, and he just loved to get stuck into them and just show them what he can sort of boss that boss that role in the park. Really, um, yeah. Played right the way up into the second division, McCauley as well. He did, yeah. It was a, it was obviously a, an opportunity came along when Steve Patterson, who'd managed him at Elgin, took him to Cali Thistle as well, and 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 yeah, I think it was a hard decision for Ian to leave a club that he loved at Elgin, but he he went to Cali Thistle and he and. By all accounts, I never saw him play for Cali Thistle. By all accounts, his performances was, were, ju- were just as good, uh, but at a higher level, which just proved that he could play at a far higher level. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Neil McLennan, I've got halfway line goal. <laughs> that's that's what he's always going to be best remembered for. But when it came to the fullbacks, and and I thought to myself, right, fullbacks, who are going to play fullback here? And and the, you know they were the mainstay of the, of the Elgin City teams through the eighties and the nineties. Really, sort of like they 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 passed well mainly the eighties, but um, it was just a perfect fullback pairing. Yeah, Neil McLennan played. I, I think he broke the, the club record, and I don't know if Soapy Cameron has beaten it since. I'm, I'm not entirely I think sure. He has, yeah. Um, but in fact, I can tell you from my last 
Um, Sophie Carmen is all time leader of 538 games for Elgin. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, yeah. well Nifi probably was around about that mark anyway, but I, I can't actually remember the, the appearance record. But he was a right footed player who played left left back. He always told me that story. You know, he's just one of those guys that made the transition. You'd learn how to tackle with his left foot, and he could, he thought I could play two footed, but he was. The coolest head, he wasn't even like a, that chatty a player really, you know, he's yeah. just cool headed, calm, take the ball, um, play the passes, pick it. He was a, he was, he was a proper football player. Uh, he could get up and down the, down as well. He, he wasn't as quick as Ian, but he, d- he just played the defensive role so well and he built up some great relationships in that Elgin team. Um, and again, it was just a joy, joy to watch. And, and the goal... He didn't score just one goal against Cali. It was a halfway line one, but I think he's, he's cracked in a couple of long range ones in, in games against Cali. And they, they tended to be the big games in the Highland yeah. League at the time, you know. So the fans absolutely love Neef. Um, and I definitely a club legend for sure. And, and, and I'd have to say the best left back I've watched in, in, in this at Highland League times. Brilliant. Um, so I had to do a wee bit of um, forum hunting. It's my favourite thing for this podcast because. You'll find the best information on fan forums. Proper mm-hmm. opinions. It's not, no offense, it's not a journalist's opinion. It's mm-hmm. people who have watched these players probably play over years. And all I got for Dave Moreland was nutter. <laughs> 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 but a good player, really good player, but a nutter. That's all I could find on him. Um, and it was from, it was actually an Ad- Aberdeen fan forum from a guy who'd played five asides against him. So it was just a random fan. So I don't know what he's done to be called a nutter in a five asides tournament. <laughs> but <laughs> he probably did what he did throughout his career. Because, uh, you know, if Ian MacArthur was a hard tackling player, then, you know, Dave Moreland was, was way beyond that. He just, he, he, he just, he was so stocky and strong and a great organiser of the team. He just led by example. Many times, I, well, these main two clubs that I saw him play play for, were, well, in particular Huntley, Steve Patterson's really successful uh, team. Nice, he, he, start, yeah. he started the five in a row sort of team then, and he was he was tremendous at the back. We played for Cove Rangers with great distinction as well, and, and he was he was kind of a horrible player to play against because he just he, he tackled like a like an engine, you know, he was like a getting hit by a tractor sort of thing, you know, when when he when he hit you, but he he, he then would take the ball. Off, off of the full back and he would just peerlessly sort of play these passes and just roll them about so he was a really good football player as well Yeah, it just got to the point where there was maybe somebody who was a little bit quicker than him then, then he knew what to do with him and that was just hitting him as hard as, <laughs> as possible uh, get away with it then it's a common you? thread coming in this team <laughs> yeah, in, in I, no messing with the team like uh, Graham Marson I picked Graham more than anything for the longevity of his career I mean it was incredible he's playing in, playing football in his 40s yeah. uh, and I again he played for Elgin in, in his younger days and that would have been sort of very early 80s but uh, his main he, made, he played for Devon Vale as well but the main stretch of his career was was for Lossie Mouth when he was player manager um, just playing the sweeper role at the back great organiser um, yeah. I think he's the kind of player I would have liked to played alongside in my team because he just sort of talked his way through it and and again he wasn't shy at hard tackle either no but that's the defensive breeds that you needed um but but more than anything a lot of the guys in the, in this in this team are just guys who played for a very long time and and played with distinction in the game and graham certainly did that absolutely uh russell mckay who was actually a, a captain um the 92 93 season obviously the the, the, the disputed season I don't dispute it it's not it's no disputed how can you strip him of a title like that but um, he was captain very good player as well very good player very um, cultured player and and he just he did, he did everything about his, his midfield game you know he, he, his passing was fantastic he was box to box he had an engine he scored a lot a lot of goals for a midfield player uh, in the sort of like the, maybe the Brian Cameron and sort of mould there as well yeah, but but more flair than Brian Cameron. Yes. Say. Yeah. Yeah. He had he, he, great flair. I mean, you, you just see him pivot in the middle of the park. He would just uh, do a little spin, and he would take two guys out. Just, just be pure technique, really. Um, yeah. But he was, he was such a hard working player. He had a great attitude as well. Um, you know, he's one of these sort of level headed guys that that led the team well. Sometimes your captain's your loudest player. Russell wasn't a, a loud player, but he, he he sort of played by example and led and led you know some really good Elgin teams there. And I think for for many seasons was regarded by opposition managers and players as the best midfield player by far in the Highland League you know so yeah great and career players around him were probably louder than him probably more aggressive than him but it just kind of shows that he took the armband and 
kind of calm and composed and led by example rather than led by aggression. Uh, he played. He played for many years alongside Michael Teasdale, who, who some people would say, well, Michael had more impact in his career. He he obviously went up and went and played for Cali Thistle and Dundee in his career and went further. Russell, I think just being a local boy, didn't really want to play for anyone else. And maybe in the same way as Brian Cameron these days as, as well, could have played at a higher level, but chose to play for his his local team. And um, yeah, just class a class act throughout his career and again a, a long career that he held as well you know and played and played at a top level throughout it yeah agreed um martin lyle Cali, i'm thinking Cali, yeah martin w- w- again was one of those players that i just remember seeing play you know he was just so committed he was part of one of the best high league teams that i've ever seen for uh, the Cali team al- although we we hated seeing them beat elgin uh, with a regular basis you know it was like i think it was one season that Cali went unbeaten and he was the guy that one of those guys that just stood out for me because he had the blend of of strength and a cultured play as well. His two boys both play Highland League just now as well. And again, it's like sons don't always follow their, their father's footsteps. There's um, Cami and and uh, Scott. I think they both play in, in the Highland League at the moment. But Martin was hard as nails. Um, took a ball, played it around in some really really boggy pitches, and he, what an engine he had. Yeah. Um, and I actually played against him in a match uh, towards the end of his career. He joined the Elgin for a season. And he's okay. and it was this guy who I'd, I'd always admired, sort of thing, watching him and just, just thinking what, what a cultured player he was. Uh, and I, I was playing for, I think it was Murray Social with a friendly against Elgin City at the start of their season um, at Borough Briggs. And I... I was up against him in the centre and midfield and, and, and I, was, I was thinking, it's was, was like, right, he's at you know, the end of his career and I was probably still mid-twenties or something. I thought maybe he could have a bit of running of him and, and he just, he said, he, he sort of shielded the ball perfectly from him. I couldn't get even near the ball and then there was one 50-50 that came and I, I didn't even see him coming. He just hit me and I think I was about as high as the floodlights. <laughs> and I thought, friendly game? What friendly game are we getting here? <laughs> so, uh, I picked myself up. In fact, I... I I seem to remember. I was, I was trying to sort of pretend. All oh, right, okay. I've, uh, no, that's fine. I'm not. I'm not feeling an injury here. So I think, and, and then I was like, right, my knees really hurting me just now. So I try to just pretend. Oh, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. And then at half time, I just, I'm really tired here, man. Oh, I was going to swab you anyway. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I got a first first hand. I got to learn just just how, how tough and tough a player, but a cultured player as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, a player who had a uh, wee mention on episode 7 from Alan Main he was in his 11 as well um, Hamish French okay um, yeah. so I, I love that a local footballer has made it into two people's 11s I think that's absolutely fantastic um, yeah. talk us a wee bit because with Alan's one we were like we had so much to get into an hour, an hour um, or an hour and a bit that we kind of ran through his 11 can you give us a bit more on what kind of player Hamish was well you just I talk about players that just stood out like a sore thumb in a, in a match, and, and straight away you saw you saw Hamish French just being a skillful guy, full of technique. Uh, I don't think he played Highland League all that long because he was snapped up by the Scottish League clubs. He went on and played in particular. I think he played for the, the, with a lot of distinction for Dunfermline, who, he, who he may did, well have signed, yeah. who may well have signed him from Keith. He just. I've seen the word cultured again, but he he was so so weird. I'm sorry, um, he went to uh, Dundee United with Alan. That's right. Yeah, that's and, right. and then Dunfermline picked him up for ah, Dundee yeah. United. Yeah, sorry. Okay. No, that does make sense. I right? when I think about it now, and 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 it did happen in, in high league football that time. You know, where guys who really were at a top level, uh, and and guys that you could see had, had, had a combination, a real natural ability, but also guys who were, you know of the right culture in terms of like they they knew they had to work hard to kind of work into this team. Keith had that amazingly talented team at the time uh, and they were you know, winning honours I think they won three Highland League titles in a row uh, French was was a fabulous player and a really really good team T- to stand out in that really good team just t- told you everything about him and you always think will he get the opportunity to, to sort of play at a better level which he did his, his career drove on for there and yeah. he's just one that always sticks in my mind I think I probably couldn't name a Highland League team without putting Hamish French in it because um he, Phenomenal. He, he was the kind of star of the show and by far the best player in the Highland League at that time. Yep, agreed. Uh, well, I agreed with what Alan was saying that he um, he never done anything flashy. He just done everything correct. I think Alan mm-hmm. said, what Alan said about him. Um, and just um, a fundamental game is strong and just good, good all round player, good at everything. No, all, always wanted the ball. Yeah, um, always looking for the ball. He just didn't want it, a hiding place, and even it could be a horrible 
monkey game and the rain's teaming down and it's this he's he's in a, like a muddy kind of park, something like that. He just is giving that ball and he would make it work in, in any conditions. Yeah, that's what you need. Okay, um, I've got a funny note about my next one because um, I don't know if anyone's seen it. Kami Keith, a Highland League legend, absolute legend, goal scorer. Um, tell us about Kami Keith. Is is he one of the best pure goal scorers you've ever seen in the Highland League? Well, the, what I can say about Kami is it's, it's a career that I probably followed from start to finish uh, because that's been my sort of era of journalism. And so I can remember him when he was an 18 year old and first signing for Keith. And you just knew that it was, you know, his, his goal scoring instinct was was fantastic. His pace, uh, he definitely was. He definitely was one of the one of the best strikers that I've seen in the in the modern era in, in Highland League football because his goal record speaks for itself. And it and it wasn't the same type of goals that he scored either. He was sticking in headers. He was running from the halfway line. He was doing the bread and butter ones in and around the penalty box. But he could do pretty much everything: left foot, right foot. Um, and again, it was it was a good Keith team, but he didn't always do it in a good Keith team. He, he played in some pretty average Keith teams towards the end of his career. Yeah. But he was still delivering the 20, 25, 30 goals uh, every season. And it's it's just an incredible scoring record in, in a very competitive Highland League that he's just kept on doing it, kept on doing it. And he probably packed in too early as well. I still think he could be playing. Still uh, scoring. I see a, a, a follow him in Strava and he's... he's Running ridiculous five Ks, it's uh, you know I think Kami must be pushing forty now or something, but I I, I don't know what age he is. Uh, I'm probably I'm probably being a bit unfair though, actually. He's not pushing forty, but he's uh, he was supremely fit and mm. he just had a great attitude to football. Always wanted to kind of do better. He was always aiming for the goal the goal records as well. He always had an eye on those, and he, but it was never to the detriment of the team because he was always like picking a pass. It was a better placed uh, striker there as well. So yeah. a goal machine. There's a famous uh, poster down in Glasgow about him. Do you know about that? Oh, it was something to do with <laughs> the name Keith and the name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's it's the poster. Poster literally says, "There's a guy called Keith from Keith who plays for Keith." <laughs> 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 so I it was on a just kind of like the ones you see in a bus station and things. I can't yeah. remember what it was advertising. It was advertising something funny, but I remember being down in Glasgow and being like. I know who that is, you know, it's it's a little surreal moment. They seem to be fascinated by the whole Keith thing, just Keith in general, down in, down in the central belt. It was like, what, it's just this one guy that just, he's the whole team, is he, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, Martin Stewart, 308 goals. That's uh, that's the stat I've got. Um, obviously a fantastic goal scorer. Best, better goal scorer than Kami Keith? I think he played a bit longer than Kami. I wouldn't like to compare the two, to be perfectly honest. Different yeah. eras. Um, and and Martin was part of, again, a really, really, really good Huntley team. Uh, so they were creating a lot of chances for Martin. But again, he he could take him from the halfway line. He'd come through. He'd a, he'd a fearsome shot on him. Mm-hmm. Um, and he played alongside you know, really, really good strikers. Like It was Gary White, Brian Thompson and Martin Stewart was the most fearsome forward line I've ever seen. And that was this, it was basically three forwards uh, attacking football that Steve Patterson played at Huntley. Yeah. Martin was the guy that probably was, the, for me, the most all-round uh, of those three. And he was, he was scoring the different types of goals as well. Uh, and again, a really, really good temperament and attitude for the game. Uh, I just thought he has to go in there. And, and, and I'm missing out a lot of top-class Highland League strikers but, but you know yeah. that I haven't got a mention in this team. But... Uh, from that from that era, sort of in the nineties, uh, I think I think he was probably the best the best of the lot in that in the Highland League at the time, and and he I think he had opportunities as well to play further afield as well. And I think maybe had trials with Dundee United and didn't, didn't come to anything. Okay, um, but terrific player. Over like if you look at like the last maybe 20, 30 years in the Highland League, there's quite a few names that will reach that two three hundred goals mark. Mm-hmm. Um, who do you say is the best pure goal scorer? Just just for goals, doesn't have to be the types of finish. Just for putting the ball in the back of the net that you've seen in the Highland League in the last thirty years. Oh, that's a tough one. Because um, we had a wee mention from Frazee. Um, would Ian Stewart ever come into that? Yeah, uh, yeah, he would. And and again, that, that's one of the names that could could well be in that team. And I, I took great joy at watching Ian play. I mean, obviously he played. You know, uh, for many years in in the, the Scottish League as well. Yeah, the different types of goals. I, I can remember. I'd, I've never seen a striker score so many lobbed goals uh, as Ian Stewart. When he went mm-hmm. through and goal, he just spotted opportunity. He just, I think, it just it was almost like a scientific method where he just knew that 
he could get the ball over the goalkeeper's head and he could get the perfect loft on it. And yeah. But he, it's not as if that was the only type of goals he scored. Um, he's once scored, I think, five in a game at Peterhead and lost. He won 8 0 or something. I see and remember that's an, an incredible yeah. match in, in, in my memory banks, anyway. Um, he wouldn't be far off it. I, I still think. If you even get modern day guys, like I look at guys like the guy Barber, um, Fraser Bra. Yeah. Um, fantastic goal rate. Um, a few seasons ago, you had um, Cove Rangers, what's his name? Um, Mitch, is it Megginson? Um, probably scoring 30, 40 goals a season. Obviously, I, I, I'm of opinion that Mitch Megginson was far too good for the Highland League and mm-hmm. he should have been playing at a higher level all along. Um, but in, in terms of pure goal scorers, um, like 200, I, I, I kind of get my head in, 200, 300 goals in that league's. And these guys aren't doing it over 25 seasons. They're doing it normally over 10 or 12 seasons, which is a ridiculous rate of goals per season. You quite often got guys, and maybe in the sort of like around about the 90s and that, that, that 40 and 50 goals in, in a Highland League season wasn't uncommon. Yeah, uh, It's not happening quite as often now. The, the guy at Brecon City at the moment, Grady McGrath, is scoring for fun. I think he's he's a player that looks like should be playing at a, top, a higher level. And Connor Gethins was that kind of area. Gethins could do it. But he yeah. did it in Scottish League as well. Yeah. Um, um, just instinctive striking ability. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, that, that's why I put Kami in there. That's why I put Martin in there. Yeah. Amazing goal records and just, just finishers, different types of goals. Now that you've mentioned Ian Stewart's name, I feel quite bad for not putting him <laughs> in there, you know. We've gave him a mention. He's had a mention on another one as well. So he is highly highly rated through everyone we've spoke to, like. And um, last in the 11s, Wilson Robertson. The note I've got for him is he scored Inverness Cully Thistle's first ever goal. Mm-hmm. Um, which, for, for anyone listening to this who doesn't really know the most about um, Highland League or that, I'm not talking about... Uh, I'm, I'm talking about Inverness Cully Thistle. So... It was a first league goal when after the two clubs had formed. Okay. Um, and not a lot of people maybe realise this, but Inverness Cali used to be Inverness Thistle and literally Inverness Cali. They were two separate teams. Right. Um, Wilson Robertson, kind of player, he was a winger, wasn't he? He was a winger uh, and a really high scoring winger. He, he, he tended to not, he, he wasn't hugging the touchline all the time. He had great pace, great skill, one of the most skillful players that I've seen in Highland League football. And I think. At the time, it, it was mainly part of a really strong Cali team, the same team as Martin Lyle played in as well. Um, mm-hmm. If Cali weren't having a very good, a very good day, or if they were playing like say Elgin or Keith, uh, I, you know, I saw these games at the time and they were sort of proper big matches where maybe the sort of tension was in the game. Dennis Wynes would have been in the Cali team at that time as well. Would he have? He was in the Cali Thistle team. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but even back to the old Cali days. Okay, um, Wilson. If it wasn't happening for for Cali and they were getting overwhelmed in certain areas, they, they tended to just look to him and just get the ball to him because they knew that he'd work his magic. Yeah. And he would sometimes take it in diagonal runs and the weavies went in the penalty box. He's come out, with, he come up with sort of countless really important Scottish Cup goals as well. When you weren't guaranteed automatic uh, qualification for the Scottish Cup, then you really had to sort of cherish your Scottish Cup moments. And Cali had some great runs. Uh, he scored in so many of their big, big games. Uh, and he, he went on to play for Bucky Thistle after that and got some some good seasons with Bucky where he was just playing the same game. He was in his later stages, but he still had the pace, he still had the skill, and he really drove on Bucky. He's really fondly remembered at Bucky as well. So uh, a, a guy who, you know, who, who's done it at a couple of clubs and, re- and really been highly regarded there, it's, uh, I just felt I had to put him into my team. Yeah. Excellent, mate. Um, thank you for the last hour and a bit. It's been, uh, as I said, I, I wanted to pick your brain. Your, your local football knowledge is second to none, really. Um, you may be going, only people maybe have more info. You are, as we say, your club historians and that, but you deal with so much locally. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to do my little Spotify stuff first, and then I'm going to finish off with my final question, Craig. Um okay. Thank you for listening. As as per usual, I need to get a bit of script for this. Right. <laughs> Have you not got a sponsor soon? Yeah, can't, I can't say too no, much. Too, say, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, again, if anyone wants to sponsor my podcast, give me a shout. Um, I ideally would like local football clubs or something like that to do. Let's try and keep it football related. If somebody wants to get in touch with me. Um, but the next answer won't be football related. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. So um, when you see it in the professional game and they're like, let's promote football, and then McDonald's is the first sponsor. Yeah. And like, mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's it's an oxymoron, isn't it? 
Um, we are now available on YouTube. Um, we're available on Apple Podcasts. We're available on Spotify. Um, we're sitting at 28 ratings as of this morning I checked. F- 27 five stars, one one star. <laughs> Still as we yeah, find who that person is. Um, if we can get to 50 ratings... Hopefully, the rest in five star. I'll do another giveaway like we did at Christmas. We've done a giveaway with signed gloves from Alan Main and some things like that. We'll do another one if we can get to 50. Because in the last couple of months, I've got some pretty cool stuff from doing all this and coaching and things like that. It's weird. Do you, do you get that when you network? You find that you start collecting things. People will give you things. You go to events and you're like, oh, I'll have this. And, you got all this stuff and I'm like, all right, well, this is pretty cool. <laughs> if, you, if, if you get Colin Henry on your podcast, then Colin's a good man for, for some some merch. He's he's uh, all right. He's okay. done a lot of work for this uh, the Keith Charity events and playing. In, he still plays in these Keith Charity events and he's always coming up with sign sign shirts and uh, I, from mm-hmm. some really really golden times in football, you know. So, well, yeah. it, it, it's happening now, Colin. You've got to give me something. I don't want a Rangers kit. No, thank you. <laughs> Sign, sign Rangers kit from 1998. There you go, Lee. <laughs> um, Wouldn't be the first time you wore one, though, would it? Oh, why did you have to bring that up? Why did you? Well, it's just to... the truth. <laughs> okay, I've worn a Rangers kit, but I'm not the kind of person to back out on a bet. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I won't. I made a bet and I lost the bet. And I got my cab come up in. How many months did it take you to go back to Thursday night football? So he's want a little story here. <laughs> um, we play fantasy football, me and my mates, um, every week. Um, we've got a league. And saying that, I've not been in that league since that's happened. Mm. I refuse to partake in this anymore because once is enough for me. Um, finish top of the league. You get to put a, someone in the league in a kit of your choice at five of sides. So I'm a massive Celtic fan and I got a full Rangers orange kit one Thursday night and I was just like, oh no. It's... But it took me six months to go to football. I was a regular attendee for every week. Mm. Avoided it for six months. <laughs> <laughs> I could. I could. So I was like, I'm not going back there. But yeah, I pretty much got forced down. Okay. My last question for you, um, Craig. Um, same question. I start. I try and start with my same question my, and finish with my same question in every podcast. My last question is: If there was one penalty to be scored and it has has to be scored to save your life, who takes that penalty? I always remember Matt Letizia. Uh He was the man. I had a wee sort of thing about Southampton at the time. I think it, it, he just it was this kind of talismanic character. He was such a lazy looking player. And something he just. He just did fancy flicks. It was you almost like you would pay the admission money alone to to, to, um, to watch mm-hmm. Matt Letizia because he scored his, his incredible, spectacular goals. His his show reel is is something special. But his penalties as well. He just used to pick a top corner or a bottom corner, and, and it was he, he varied it. You say right tonight, I'm gonna gonna stick it down the middle, whatever. You know, he just it, it was. I think he missed one. Uh, I don't know what the, yeah, what did, the start record is. Did we have this confirmed? Yeah, JP got it wrong, and Ian, as they found out, as they both went for a pint after. Coming. Yeah, so my episode five and my episode six are actually quite good pals, and they were in on the same day. And they ended up going for a pint at each other, and they'd given the same penalty, they'd given the same answer as you, both okay. of them. One of them had got it right, and one of them had got it wrong. So he'd missed one in his career. Mm. Yeah, and I think it was forty-seven out of forty-eight he scored. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, it was either forty-seven or forty-eight. One of them. Unbelievable record. That's the kind of figures that you need if your life depends on it, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say so. I'd say so. It's pretty uh, high percentages. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, people can catch Craig online in the paper. Um, I, I quite like enjoy your videos about Alan Hale and things like that, um, Gavin Price, and obviously I hope you do more of them, things like that. And I certainly will be. Um, it's part of the plan. But thank you very much for having me. No, I appreciate your time, mate. Thank you.